you know, a lot of these guys have probably done these same protocols for years, but you know, obviously with the pandemic, with COVID, a lot of people are, you know, vaccinated and we really don't know, like fixing these types of medications, mixing these drugs, but maybe it changes the chemistry in the body. Because what happens is layman obviously is, it's like a coach's fault. What about the legal ramifications? Like getting people to sign a dis disclaimer. Do you really think those that, that disclaimer, is it worth the paper it's written on? You know, people like injecting all sorts of shit, you know, injecting tests and then somebody's injecting trend and somebody's injecting AMP, I don't know if you like have. Day, like, day, like day of the show? Day of the show. Like if you came to India, you walked backstage, they, you will find more needles than no you would way. find in a vet clinic. So I tell my athletes, if you're feeling dizzy, dehydrated, drop everything. Nothing is more important than staying alive. What do you think is Phil going to do? Is Phil ever going to make a comeback or this is it you reckon or he shouldn't make a comeback? Hey, welcome everyone. Um, the person I've got today here, he doesn't need an introduction. So I've got uh, Doran ha Hamilton, um, the man who's behind HD Muscle, the man who's behind Regan Grimes, uh, formerly <laughs> behind Keon as well. That's another story. And then um, a, we can say, we can call him a pro maker, especially his recent performance over the weekend. <laughs> He's had three people turn more pros, one in figure, one in uh, bodybuilding, one in men's physique. So he's a crosshair and so I've, I've managed to squeak get 45 minutes out of Dorian's exceptionally busy schedule. Sitting in Orlando, having five athletes uh, ready to jump on the Olympia stage. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dorian. Welcome mate and thank you for your time. Thank you very much for having me. I know we've been trying to uh, coordinate something for a little while so I'm happy to get squeeze 45 minutes in here. Yeah, right. So I'm going to throw into the deep end. So how is the how is the scene in Orlando right now? You know, with everything going on, with the very unfortunate uh, passing of George, how's it all? How, how what's the atmosphere like? Well, since we got here, we got here Sunday. Um, atmosphere was great. Energy was great. The gym here, you know, just going to the gym with all the athletes and seeing other athletes like Camp Jansen's there training. You know, it's still really really good energy throughout the whole the whole week. Um, I had athletes compete on Tuesday, got a pro card, so that was amazing. But I'll reach a pro in the figure division. And then yesterday, had three more athletes competing. Two of them got pro cards. But before the men's physique, um, Mike uh, Emerson came out. Um, Antoine bumped me and was like, yo, look. And I read the Olympia post about George. And I was just like, oh, man, so sad. You know, and the first thing that kind of came to my mind um, because you know, there's been some other uh, other uh, tragedies this year, right, with the women's women's division. And the first thing that came to my mind, well, two things kind of, uh, was one, I feel like a lot of these guys trying to make weight for 212 and for classic physique, I feel like it's too extreme. I feel like they have to revisit um, the cutoffs because a lot of these guys that are competing in 212, they're peeled shredded glutes at 225 and 228. So the extremes that they have to go to to make those weigh-ins is very, very hard on the body. It's very, very hard on the organs, on your heart, dehydration, you know. So it's a big extreme getting down to that weight and then filling back up. So both of the extremes are very dangerous. And then what's even more dangerous too after that is the fact that now they are, you know, are eating different foods foods, the sodium, I think those major, major fluctuations are very hard on the body. So we don't know exactly what happened with George, um, but, you know, going by Justin, his coach's post, it seems like it was probably something to do with trying to make weight, his weigh-ins is today, and this happened yesterday. So very, very sad. Um, you know, I know George is probably, yeah, I think he's probably ready to walk on stage over 225 pounds. So I can only imagine you know, what they have to do to get, to make weight. And I've seen it with some guys and I'm just like, this is absolutely crazy. You know, Brian was just in my room last night and, you know, speaking with him and, you know, seeing what he has to do to make weight too, again, is, uh, it's very extreme. And, you know, I feel like in the classic physique division, I feel like the, the taller categories have an easier time. Like I feel like someone who's over six one and they get 230 plus pounds to make weight, is a lot different than, say, 
Breon, who's, I'm not sure exactly his height, so don't quote me, say he's 5'6", he needs to make 178. It's like, I feel like the taller guys have an easier time making weight, and the shorter guys have to really, really suffer. So I do feel like there needs to be a change. And the second thing that came to my mind this year, as we see this more and more, I don't know if there's any correlation between this at all. Um, again, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, but like, you know, a lot of these guys have probably done these same protocols for years and know their bodies and know what to expect. But, you know, obviously with the pandemic, with COVID, a lot of people are, you know, vaccinated and we really don't know, like, you know, mixing these types of medications, mixing these drugs, um, the interactions that might cause. So, you know, just because in the past you've used this protocol with diuretics and dehydrating and making weight. I don't know, maybe being vaccinated, I don't know if he was vaccinated, but maybe it changes the chemistry in the body. You know what I mean? Maybe there's more inflammation, maybe, who knows? So, yeah, it's like those are the first two things that kind of came to my mind. We'll have to wait and see on the autopsy, but it is so sad. I'm so sad about that. Yeah, he was a very you know? very popular and very respected guy from uh, what I've, whatever I've heard from everybody. I yes. think that's really sort of hit um, the industry pretty hard. I want to pick on something that you mentioned. Um, you said um, athletes having to do very extreme protocols. Now, we know there are two distinct aspects, uh, two distinct components to um, extreme protocols. One is just simply um, when it comes to coming weight or dropping <clears throat> on the body weight. One is obviously massive uh, <clears throat> dehydration factor, just natural dehydration. You're not drinking any fluid. You're cutting off sodium, you're cutting off carbs also, and then eating minimal food. So that yeah. naturally in itself uh, affects your um, electrolyte balance. Now, do you right. think that alone is enough to push people over the edge without even having to use diuretics? Or you think it's always the, the throwing the diuretics in that pushes people over the edge in your experience, you know? In my experience, in my opinion, I feel like the body, if you're not using anything that's like drug induced, I feel like your chances of, you know, having something go very wrong is very minimal. You know, okay. when, when you take those sort of drugs that maybe deplete your sodium levels, flush sodium or potassium, it's very dangerous. So I think using, you know, more of a natural approach, like if you want to flush more sodium in your body, like doing a water load. I think it's very safe, you know. I think uh, you can't go wrong that way. I think it's when you're adding the medications on top of that that, you know, things get very extreme, especially when you're trying to lose six-plus pounds in a short period of time and you're already not retaining any water. You're already very lean. So the water's got to pull from somewhere. somewhere. Okay, the muscle cells have it. The organs, like you're, you're pulling from, you know what I mean? So it becomes very dangerous. So do you think I mean, personally... So do you think it'd be sorry to, sorry to cut you? So do you think it'd be, it'd be a safe assumption to um, almost um, draw this conclusion that most of the two one two guys and most of the the classic physiques they're having to use diuretics not so much for the condition purpose, but it's more to just to make the weight. If we had to make the distinction, I think. If you took all the top 10 in the classic physique in 212 and they did not have to make weight, I think they would, some of them would probably still use diuretics, but sure. I think it would be may, maybe, you know, a quarter of what they have to do. What they have um, to do. Very minimum, very minimal in comparison to the lengths that they have to go to make weight, you know? So on top of that, you know, okay, it's one thing taking diuretics, but if they're having a hard time making weight, you know, these guys are taking diuretics. They're hopping in the sauna. They're hopping in Epsom salt baths. They're not drinking water for 24 plus hours. They're not eating food. So it's like the combination of that, how extreme that is in so many different areas. They wouldn't have to do that if, they didn't have to you know, there wasn't that. Uh, so I, th yeah. I think without, I mean, obviously you can't blame the IFBB because all, both of these, th these categories are very new in the scheme of things. They're yes. less than five years old. So I think... Yes. Um, uh, inadvertently, and this is again, I mean, obviously, I think it'll be foolish for any of us to sit here and blame the IFBB squarely. So I think what's happened happened is because since these two categories are very much in the evolution uh, process, in the evolution phase, so what's happened is just by default, not by design, just by default, uh, IFBB or just the, just the weight 
um, cutoffs is inadvertently, unintentionally pushing athletes to almost like unintentionally again forcing their hand to use these diuretics. So we, we can safely conclude that in a way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I also think there's ways that, you know, and again, I think it's maybe like I don't I can't speak for everyone's coach or whatnot, but I do think there are natural ways of like dropping water. Like for me with a lot of athletes, I feel like vitamin C, ester C is one of the most underrated ways to flush water safely. It's like I, I've seen four or five pounds of water retention just with going five, six grams of vitamin C a day. Um, so I do think there are ways maybe that people just don't know. Um, but yeah, it's really hard, right? Like the IFB does an amazing job. Um, they they don't know what these guys are doing or taking or what lengths they're going to, right? They create the divisions. Uh, but I do think when things like this happen, it kind of causes them to sit back and think and maybe go like, you know what, maybe we need to revolve a little bit, we need to change X, Y, and Z, um, just to make sure the athletes are safe. Um, but you know, there was years that went by and, and no athletes, no, 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 no issues were happening. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, uh, it's very, it's very tough, right? It is. And so I think we saw that with 212 already. There was 202 and then we went to 212. Yeah. So right. I wouldn't be, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they go to 216 or 218 or something like that. Mm. Or, I mean, a other possibility is let's just say they remove the weight cap. For instance, that's one of the possibilities. They could just com completely remove the weight cap, but they could really start rewarding the shape. They could really start marking it down and say, like, look, you know, if you don't have um, a narrow stomach, if, you don't, if you've got a bloated gut, you could be diced to the bone, but that's going to get marked against yeah. you, you know? So let's say, yeah. again, we go back to, even now, in, if we look at, say, classic physique, we're very much rewarding the genetics in a way. We're rewarding the structure. Yes. Like if we had to say, let's, um, let's compare. Let's say, for instance, if you had to compare, say, if you had to put Ronnie Coleman and uh, flick some um, uh, Wheeler toe-to-toe, -to -toe, right? And if, if we had to apply the classic physique criteria, Ronnie could have never beaten flex um, post-98 no. uh, physique. Because just because no. you're rewarding essentially the structure. So one option potentially, do you think that IFBB could just simply go, you know what, let's just remove the weight uh, cap altogether Sorry. and let's just remo reward the Brian yeah. Buchanan and the Flex Wheeler and the, the yeah. Chris Bumstead, those kind of physiques. It's funny you say that because last night I was trying to wrap my head around it, like the possibilities of what they could do. And when I thought about classic physique, you know, based on the judging criteria, that's one thing I thought. I was like, why not just not have a weight cap in any of the the weight the, the, the height classes? Let them compete and just award the best classic looking bodybuilder. You know what I mean? Like if, they, if they want to come in big and they think they look better that way, it doesn't mean they're gonna be better, right? So I feel like let's why not just have it like an open class, it's classic physique, just like open bodybuilding. It doesn't mean that just because say Steve Kuklo's to, to uh, 90 in open bodybuilding, and then you got, um, I don't know, let's say you got Hadi at 232, doesn't mean that Steve Kuklo's got an advantage over him yeah. or he's going to beat him. So I think in classic physique, I think that's sort of applies. You know what I mean? I think if the guys choose to be heavier, I mean, nine times out of ten, I think it's going to be, they're going to actually not be as good and sharp, right? Hmm. So I think just allowing them to come in where they feel their weight they look the absolute best yes. and not having to push to extremes to make a specific weight, I think that would be a really, really good transition for the division, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, well, that's a nice little segue. I want to ask you now, with this situation, like with, with as I said, you know, with uh, some, uh, some female athletes um, having passed away recently and Shelby having been under the massive pump recently, what he went through, he nearly yeah. had... He literally had to shut his Instagram down for a couple of months, almost for a month, maybe if not more. And, and then, yeah. um, you know, with the, because what happens is, you know, the layman obviously is, it's like it coach's fault. It's the fingers always yes. get pointed at the coach, coaches and the athletes. It's almost like they are doing all these things stupidly. My question is, it's, it's a matter of time bec before... It becomes mainstream when it comes to the law enforcement, let's just say. Um, yes. 
So my question is, where does this leave the coaches? What, how much pressure do you think it puts on the co coaches? Now, earlier you could just run the gauntlet and just go, you know what, okay, take this, whatever happens, happens. But now all of a sudden with social media scrutiny, uh, being in the public eye and anything when that happens, it gets magnified. Where does this leave the coaches? Yeah, I can speak for myself personally, and it's like, for me personally, um, it weighs heavily on me, my athlete's health. Um, so, you know, that's why, like, I feel like there's a lot of coaches where I see the amount of clients they have, and I'm just like, how are they taking care of this many people? Because for me, I had to get rid of, like, 25 clients earlier last year, done it a couple times, and it was very hard for me. It was, like, so hard because I care so much about these people. But when I get to a point where I feel like, I'm not on top of everything and I'm doing a check-in and I can't remember like where we're at or like if I told them to take, you know, this health product and I'm not in full control. Um, it's a very uncomfortable feeling for me because I like to know exactly what everyone's doing and make sure that I didn't forget to tell them something. So I can only help so many people and I pay, a, like I put a lot of attention to detail on health, you know, making sure guys are checking blood blood pressure because that's one thing you know people think all oh, steroids are really bad for you and yes over long term they can be um, but sometimes it's the effects like one person might take you know a certain steroid and they might get no rise in blood pressure but if the next person takes it and it gives them high blood pressure and now they're running high blood pressure for three four years it's a high blood pressure that's going to cause long-term health issues right so i think it's important um that coaches play paid uh, cl pay close attention to their athletes, blood pressure, um, you know, blood work, um, making sure you know, their blood glucose is in healthy ranges, all these things, right? And, like, that's why we created HD Muscle was because, like, I feel like there was a major gap in the industry where, like, even health products, you know, I was having to go out and buy astragalus and pine bark extract and all these specific ingredients to make sure that, you know, the kidneys, the liver, everything's healthy, the heart. So that's why I, we actually created that so to have convenient products that have everything in one that people can take to ensure they're healthy um yeah i think like there's a huge uh, responsibility on coaches i think about that all the time sorry to interrupt what about the legal ramifications like i want to ask a specific question a very common practice in the industry is getting people to sign a dis disclaimer okay you know i'm responsible for my own health yada 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 do you really think uh, the way the current legal system, especially in the U.S. and a lot of other countries, do you really think those pieces of paper are worth the, that disclaimer? Is it worth the paper it's written on? You know, the, what are the legal ramifications like this? I I know, right? When push comes to shove, you really I really don't know. It's it's. Uh... It's do you tough. think, do you think IFB, IFBB has a, now the pressure is on IFBB to actually step in as a, as a body and do form like some sort of another, uh, like say in a lot yeah, of sports, you have to say something. athlete associations and the team as, is a, like, the, the, like in every sport, you, you have know. athlete associations. Do you think it's time now for IFBB to, to be cognizant and take note and say like, look, if we don't have coaches, we are not going to have athletes, and if we don't have athletes, we're not going to have any sports. Yeah. So do you yeah. think there is a role for IFBB to just go step in and say, okay, we've got to protect all these coaches? Just a thought. It's almost like they, they, it's almost like they can create some type of like uh, certification or something like that to be an IFB pro coach or something. You know what I mean? Something to make sure the coaches actually know what they're doing and uh, – you know, responsible with their athletes. Or maybe, yeah, it's, may, it's or not maybe, a, maybe even have, like, say, uh, for, for example, say if, you, if you're playing in NFL or if you're playing in a major league uh, or you're in the defense or you're in the army or whatever. So, like, say, let's say you're, you're flying, okay? So in flying, what normally would happen is you would have to go through the batteries of tests. You have to get clearance before you can get up in the air. So do you yeah. think one possible solution could be is that if you are an IFBB pro, right, you have to submit X blood test every three months for it's almost like, okay, so if, yeah, you actually bit, yeah, don't, yeah. if your parameters are below this, you can't compete. So then, true, true. I mean, I'm just thinking on that. Yeah. 
No, I, I think that is that is a very, very valid point. You know what I mean? Like maybe three months out from the Olympia, you know, they have to submit blood work. And if you don't meet a certain, your liver enzymes, kidney, cholesterol, heart, if everything's like out of crazy range and you're like borderline, you know what I mean? Like not going to make it, then, you know, that is a way to gauge athletes and make sure they are healthy, right? I think this is something very new. I think like with the evolution of bodybuilding, more and more people now are doing blood work you know, monitoring their health, you know, back in the day, like I worked with so many coaches and like, no one ever asked for blood work. No. They didn't even know how to read it. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like they didn't even know, you yeah. know what I mean? I think back to like some of the coaches coming up and I learned a lot working with all these guys. I worked with all of them. And then some of the stuff they had me on and like the amount of antiestrogens and how unhealthy and dangerous that was for long periods of time for cholesterol. I'm just like shaking my head. Like, how are these guys still going at it in respect? Because I'm like, oh my God, it's like the amount of damage on people's health, right? And just, they probably just don't know the cause and effect. They're just like, oh, you know, I tried this before and it worked for a client, so I'm going to do it for the next guy. And never asking for blood work or, you know, to see the cause and effect of what's going on in the body with these compounds. Mm. So I think it's really important. Yeah, I, I think, I think, um, I think we can't, um, uh it, 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 it's it's too of um, an elef elephant in the room that you can't just put a put a blanket on and say like okay no let's just just turn let's just turn yes, our head away yes, and I think yes. it's, it's the monster has become too big. If they want to protect the sport, they want Mr. Olympia to continue. I think they'll have to do they'll have to do something. Okay, now <clears throat> um, an important question I want to ask you is we we touched upon blood work and all that. What are some of the common blood tests that you uh, recommend your um, athletes or some of the common tests that you think uh, if you have to sort of prioritize five or seven or ten tests, what are some of the things that you get done or you just simply pass your athletes on to uh, to, uh, to a medical professional and let them uh, deal with it or is it yeah. like a, a, a yeah. bit, a bit mm -hmm. of a... Um, so a in Canada, so in Canada, um, I send all my athletes to Dr. Adil Khan, which I believe you actually coached him for a bit. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, he works yes. out of, yeah, yeah, he works out of the Gallia Clinic. So he knows what I'm looking for, and he helps take care of them, their blood work, make sure they're healthy. So basically a full panel. Like, I want to make sure, you know, all their hematology, their, you know, red blood cells, hematocrit, everything's in healthy ranges, full lipid panel, you know, all their cholesterol, everything like that, um, their organs, their kidneys, their liver. I even pay attention to their hemoglobin A1C, um, you know, which is a blood glucose average, C-reactive protein, the amount of inflammation in their body, uh, pretty much everything, even estrogen levels, testosterone levels, thyroid function. So I think it's really good to have an overview, and I think it's really good to save that and look at it over a long period of time. If you notice, you know, you're bodybuilding for three, four years, and you're slowly trending up with, you know, your GFR, like your levels are all getting worse, it's not a good trend, right? You want to keep things sort of stable. So that's what I really like about doing the blood work is over a long period of time, reflect like back to three years ago, and you can see how things are trending. Yeah, so I really, uh, yeah, I pretty much try and check every, everything. Okay. Everything so on let, me, let, me, let, me ask, let me ask you another question because, see, I, I, I work with a lot of athletes. I, I run certifications. I go around um, India. I go in Australia as well. Um, delivering these workshops with contest prep and trying to sort of educate people to keep them safe. One of the questions that I always get asked, and I'm sure you get asked, always like, how do I get big? How do I get big? Like, I want to get massive. You know, I want to become a mass monster. Obviously, there's a certain amount of, you need a certain amount of genetics. We know the hard work, the consistency, and all those kind of things. So if you had to sort of, we had to sort of go to the dark side, we had to go towards the, the, the drug side. Let's talk yes. purely in isolation about drugs. That what is it that the, the, the pro level, the higher level athletes doing oh. as far as the drugs go? So if we had to talk purely in isolation about drugs, let's talk about the mainstream yes. steroids and the role of insulin and the growth of growth hormone yes. and all these fancy things. What is it on top of genetics that is setting these guys apart and taking them from, say, 210 pounds yes. and getting them up to 240, 250 pounds. Yeah. So first, yeah, I think genetics plays a huge role. Second, I think it's time and consistency. So a lot of these guys have done it for a long period of time and they're very consistent, right? 
So that's something that like you can't just inject. You know what I mean? The work ethic, going to the gym, making sure you're eating your five, six meals a day, making sure you're sleeping seven, eight hours a day. All these things are in your control and those things need to be as close to 100% as possible. So when you do that, and then on top of that, you're adding anabolic steroids, you know, GH, insulin, these types of things are creating synergy and helping your body pretty much recover faster and grow faster from the workouts, you know, with the food you're eating, with the recovery of the sleep. So all those pieces of the puzzle need to be there. Um, also, even staying hydrated. I feel like there's a lot of people that don't understand the importance of staying hydrated. You know, they, they don't drink enough fluid. You know, our muscles are a very, very large percent of water. Um, so that's something that I think a lot of people miss out on. Um, and when it comes to like drugs, I don't think, I think a lot of people are misinformed and they think that the pros are using monster amounts of drugs. And this might be true for some, right? Obviously there are, sure. there's always going to be guys that are using tons. And everything. And, yeah. And maybe they respond really well to that and, you know, they've got success that way. But for the most part, I think it's everything else. It's the lifestyle. It's the training. It's everything else they're doing is bang on. And then adding those things. And as people grow in bodybuilding, like even myself, as I come up, I've seen, you know, a lot of things that I did wrong from a drug perspective and a drug protocol. So, you know, like working with Broderick Chavez, I've, I've learned a lot over the last little bits. And uh, just making sure like you're as efficient as possible. You know, you don't need as much as certain compounds if you're able to create proper synergies within the drugs. You know, some drugs pretty much do the same thing in the body, right? So like a lot of guys, for example... Um, you know, if you research Broderick Chavez, basically has three columns. You got your testosterone-based drugs, you know, which is like which is test EQ, um, things like uh, D ball. They're pretty much all doing the same thing in the body, boosting testosterone. Then you got your 19 noir drugs, which is your Decas, your MPPs, your Trena, your Parabolin. And then you got your DHT-based drugs, which is your Primo, your Winstrol, your Mass P. So. He, like, what I sort of learned from him was instead of doing, like, two drugs from the center column, test and EQ, which are virtually doing the same thing, and, and what's happening is, what's happened to me um, coming up, because that was, like, a typical thing, test and EQ in the offseason, um, guys are, their testosterone levels are through the roof, and then it's creating high, hematic, high hemoglobin, and red blood cells are through the roof, and then it's very, it can be very hard, difficult to bring those down, so they're at risk. Um, so, you know, picking one drug from each column. So, you know, you're, your testosterone, you know, and, and again, like for me, I, you know, I just did a show, I used 500 milligrams, you know what I mean? Where some people might think guys are using 1500 plus, you know, I think like maybe if you're a 270 pound shredded bodybuilder, okay. Maybe someone like that would be upwards to 750, maybe a gram, but that's high. And then, uh, you know, picking a drug if you're in the off season, I would use uh, a DECA based drug, right? So DECA or MPP. It was pre contest in, in that column, that 19 noir. I, you'd, you'd maybe switch to eight weeks out, six weeks out, maybe a trend, you know? And then on the other column, um, with your DHT based drugs, you know, you can sort of, like, I would start a pre contest with Primo, and then as you got closer to the show, you know, if we started 16 weeks out, at eight weeks out, I'd switch to like a, a master on P, you know, and then with things like orals and stuff like that, we would add more DHT based drugs, but it'd be for a very short period of time, maybe four weeks, you know, adding things like Winstrel tablets or Halo testing, those things don't need to be used for a long period of time. They're very hard on the body. You know, Halo, 20 days, 16 days, it's going to get the job done. It's going to make you rock hard. Winstrel, four weeks, like you're already lean. You're already there. Those types of drugs are just going to make you hard, dense. So, and then, uh, you know, I do feel like in insulin can be very beneficial. It really depends on the person. Um, blood glucose, so that you have to get a blood glucose monitor in order to gauge this. I feel like the genetic freaks in the world that, you know, partition food very efficiently and put on crazy amounts of muscle, like Ronnie Coleman, they probably had unbelievable blood glucose levels. So their ability to, you know, take in carbohydrates, store them as muscle energy, um, you know, the way people put on body fat is by compounding. So if you eat meal one and then you go to eat meal two and your blood glucose levels are still elevated and now you're putting another meal in you, it hasn't finished with the other meal. And now you're putting that in your compounding. So every meal throughout the day, your blood glucose is going to get elevated. So if you eat when you're in a more, uh, 
better environment, like say under 4.8, um, your body's going to take those carbs in and use them more efficiently for muscle, for growth, for energy, for glycogen. So if you eat more carbs and you're, you know, in the fives, you're going to risk burning body fat. And I also feel like that's a major reason why people get bloated and distended guts is from not paying attention to blood glucose and they're just eating food on top of food and it's not efficient. So a way that you could use insulin, you know, insulin is essentially just taking um, the load off the pancreas. So you're able to eat more carbs and it's going to help your body. It's going to do it for you essentially. So take the load off the pancreas and it's probably actually even healthy for people that are eating high carbohydrate diets because the way you get diabetes is by having high blood glucose, compounding, eating food on top of food, being high, and then your pancreas gets worn out because it can't keep up with producing all the insulin. So as a bodybuilder, um, to strategically you know, find ways to utilize, say like you know, I, for Humalog, I, I use it pre and post workout. Um, and it's different for everyone. I wouldn't use it every day. Maybe it's on a weaker body part, a high carb day. Um, it's very tailored. And the reason why I don't speak about it very often is because I feel like it's, it can be very dangerous because people can do it very wrong. You have to know how to do it. You have to know how to time it out. You have to know how many grams of carbs to eat when you're doing it. And I feel like people measure it wrong. So I would ne never recommend to do it unless you have a coach or someone that is showing you exactly how to do it because it can go very, very wrong. Very, wrong, very quickly. Very quickly. So it's not something to be taken lightly. It's not something to be like, oh, I heard so-and-so uses Humalog or insulin. I'm going to try it. Do not. You need to make sure. Like my clients, some of them are competing at the Olympia level. I will not let them do it. Like I'm speaking to one of them now. I'm like, when I get back to the Olympia, I'm like, no, 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 don't start it. I'm like, I'm going to be on video with you showing you exactly how to do it. Because it can go very wrong. But yeah, it's just going to help your body be able to uptake more carbs. So around the workout, it can be useful uh, if you're trying to jam a lot of carbs and say amino acids into your cells pre-workout, post-workout, um, and it will take the load off your pancreas. So that's nice. Um, and then growth hormone, I think, has its place as well. But again, there are negative effects. If people are abusing growth hormone, it can actually uh, you know, be bad for you know, your body's natural insulin production. So, you know, that's why it's important to pay attention to blood glucose. It can make you insulin resistant. Um, yeah, but it can also be very beneficial. So it's uh, the, the, all these things together in combination. It's not one or two things. It's a synergy created with these, you know, these drugs, the insulin, the GH, that work together with the hard work in the diet, in the sleep, the rest, everything together, the synergy is what is creating, you know, these athletes that are like the best of their ability, right? So there's many, many pieces to the puzzle, right? Yeah, sure, no, I totally so. get it. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what's the scene in the US, but in the subcontinent, there's a massive craze that there's something about peptides and psalms, and that's the holy grail. That's the, 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 the missing ingredient. Yeah. That's the secret. And um, yeah. What's your what's your take on it on peptides and sums? Yeah, is that is that the, is that the so, missing link? <laughs> honestly, I don't use any with any clients. I've tried them myself years ago. Uh, what kind of freaks me out about them is just like we don't know the long term um, effects of them. Yeah. There's not enough data. There's not enough research. They're relatively new. Um, so yeah, that kind of freaks me out a little bit. Um, doesn't sit well with me. Um, with the peptides, I think probably some of the peptides at the BPC, the ones for healing, the ones for recovery, one for probably had their place. Yeah. Like when Antoine tore his bicep, he used the BPC, um, which was also recommended by Dr. Khan because he had good success with it. Um, but uh, but yeah, I just feel like you know some of these peptides that increase your 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 uh, your GH levels and stuff like that. I just feel like. You know, it's so short acting. You got to do it like 20 times a day to get the best results. I just feel like if you're going to spend the money and you're going to put this in your body and you're putting in all the hard work and effort, I just feel like the best bang for your buck is the real thing. So GH. would it would it be safe to conclude on this this specific topic that um, that obsession that a lot of um, I think amateur level bodybuilders or people who are in the industry only for four or five years are under the obsession that people have 
They're looking for that secret, looking for that holy grail. Actually, there is no secret. In my experience, I can speak for myself and, you know, I haven't spoken to so many people and doctors and worked with so many athletes. In my experience, um, this is what I tell people. I said, like, look, there's an every bit of chance that the pro that you're looking at, the mass monster that you're looking at, there's an every bit of chance is actually using lesser drugs than your local national level amateur NPC bodybuilder or whatever, you know. Yes. The reason why yes. they look like that is uh, because they just, they're just genetic freaks and they put in the work. Uh, I, I, I always take example of say, somebody like say Phil, okay. Now, I, I can only speculate, okay, for somebody like Phil to, to maintain a physique like that, he's probably not using any more than HRT level dosages. He's barely probably yeah. using TRT levels like maybe... 250 minutes. If we averaged out Phil's use over 12 months or somebody of Phil's size over 12 months, I can guarantee when you take into account the, the, the off season and off the drugs and everything, it would average out probably less than 150 to 250 milligrams a week across 12 months. That would be, I yes. would be, I would be willing to bet like I, 10, I, 10 yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with that because even myself, I stepped away from bodybuilding for five, six years. You know, I just recently competed, uh, but all pretty much that entire time, you know, there was the odd time I, I bumped it up a little bit in the summertime or whatever. Sure. But the majority of the time, I was basically trying to do blood work and just to see where my levels would still be like, kind of superhuman, but still in range. You know what I mean? And I was taking 150 milligrams a week of testosterone, and my levels were still over the natural production of what a male should be at. And I'll tell you, I'm not a genetic freak. I have good genetics. I'm not nowhere like these crazy genetic freaks, best bodybuilders. And I was still strong. I still maintained 245, 250 pounds. Yeah, the composition wasn't what it is now, like having done a, you know, a pre-contest, but I was still able to keep up with the guys. I still was like, you know, superhuman at 150 milligrams. So now if you take a guy that has the best genetics in the world, I can only imagine, you know, what he's able to do on 150 milligrams. So, yeah, it's like, you know, and I've talked to a lot of guys. It's like, you know, I'm friends with a lot of guys that are retired bodybuilders and stuff, and I know what they do, and they're still maintaining a very, very good physique. And, uh, yeah, you can do a lot, man. It's it's a lifestyle. It's everything else. The yeah, diet, it's, yeah. it's the work. It's, it's everything else, yeah. you know. All right. So. Um, uh, we're going to sort of wrap up soon. Um, if you had to, let's say, give your two minutes on dummies advice for peak week, okay? If you had to say, like, if somebody was like, Dorian, I beg you, give me something, like, if I could, if I knew nothing about bodybuilding, but if I had to prep someone, what would be your dummies advice, dummies peak week for somebody? Like, okay, if all else, if you don't want to just do this. Yeah. Dummy peak week. Well, first, I think the most important thing someone can do is is try and be ready three weeks out, maybe four weeks out. So at the end of you know at the end of your competition prep, you can start playing a little bit with some higher carb days. See how you fill up, so you know what to expect the week of. So if you have been doing that at four weeks out, you're already ready, and you've been playing around with like maybe two high carb days, and you found what works well for your body. Cause the effect, digestion, the fullness, I would basically do nothing. If right. you're in shape, don't change a thing. So you no, know what I mean? no dropping have, water, no dropping salt, none of the fancy shit. The day of the show, just reduce the water a little bit. You know, reduce the water a little bit, you know, just so you're not so full. You know, but that, that's about it. Like, if you're ready, you're ready. You know, I mean, if you have a coach that is very hands-on, obviously he knows how to make manipulations. But if you're doing it yourself... The safest way is get ready and just show up. Show up as if it's another day at the gym and you are ready. You know, everyone talks about how sick they look a week out, two weeks out when they train chest and they felt great. And the day of the show, they do all these manipulations. They're flat. They're watery. They're smooth. So yeah, okay, I for, would for, the, for the for the for the for the for the fear of uh, for the lack of um, for the fear of being called 
Uh, Dorian didn't give me anything, man. That's like, yeah, I heard that before. <laughs> so, you know, like, yeah. come on, bro. You, you, there's got to be okay. like, you know, like, there's, there's you, some, you know, okay. when there, to drop water, things. when to drop salt. You know, give okay. me something, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I, okay, if you're flat, like, one thing that I like to do with guys is a couple of meals before the show. Um, like, I get all my guys to use about a quarter teaspoon of salt. So maybe the two meals before we do cut the water back a little bit, I would then double or triple the sodium intake to keep them full, keep the body, um, you know, saturated and full. Try to think vitamin C. I would definitely, if you're doing everything the same five days out, put in the vitamin C, you know, let's say four or five grams, ramp it up. Maybe like on the Monday before a Friday, start with like uh, one gram three times a day and then maybe ramp it up by day three, maybe do it four times a day. What, what about um, the diarrhea then? What, what about the losers? You're running to the toilet. Well, so how do you manage that? <laughs> no, it's not too bad. It's not not too, it's not too aggressive with like the, the vitamin C, but it will dry you out. Like Regan right now, for example, uh, we basically started the vitamin C on Monday and he's lost like five pounds and we're increasing his carbs every day leading into the show here about 15% a day, and he's losing weight. He came to the room this morning. He's lighter than he was yesterday. So it's, it's very, very strong. So, so what do you, what do you, think, so what would you, so what would you recommend with, with, the, with the water? Do, like, do you keep it like steady? Do you increase it and then cut it? Or, I mean, what's your... Uh... Um, I, I, I think the safest thing without obviously knowing the client working with them would be to keep it steady and then just like the night before the show, maybe just cut it down a bit in the day of the show don't cut it but just kind of drink as you know as needed to the show yeah. if the show yeah if the show was at like if your prejudging was like 11 o'clock i don't know maybe you have 750 mils between waking up in the show um what was i going to say though the one thing was ah damn it i just forgot sodium ah, sodium it was something it wasn't it wasn't sodium it wasn't <laughs> sodium ah ah i just forgot i just forgot but yeah, I think I, I think keeping it simple, you know. Um, I also like backstage uh, before going out. So if you've cut back the water a little bit, I like to use like a cyclic dextrin and a carb ten. Like we make carb HD, and this is why I formulate it. So it's a blend of cyclic dextrin and carb ten, which has prebiotic properties with coconut powder. And then I'll get them to add. Um, depending on the person, quarter teaspoon, half teaspoon, and 20 minutes before they go out, they would basically sip on that while they're pumping up. But I also get them to use that the last three weeks intra-workout so their bodies are accustomed to training, driving those nutrients into the muscle. So it's nothing that we haven't and done. Digestion is, di di digestion is key yes. at the time, yeah. Because it, that, yes, it can yes. really mess with the digestion if you're like taking glucose or... Um, any fast yes. absorbing um, uh, carbohydrates yep. at that time, it can really mess with, especially when you add yep. a bit of a sodium. Sugars. Yeah. Yeah, when people add sugar. So that's, that's another thing I, I do with a lot of my guys is I make sure the day of the show, the food is cut back drastically. It's small meals. You We're not, if you're if, if you're trying to eat huge the day of the show and you're competing, big mistake. These guys that are backstage and you see them, they're about to go out and they're eating a muffin. What is that muffin going to do? It's going to take about an hour and a half, two Dude, hours in your gut to 100%. break down. There's like 35 grams of fat in it. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you should be ready by that time and eat minimal. I heard like Durian Yates, the day of the show, he would basically just get up and eat minimal and just go on stage. Yeah. He's ready, right? So my, my recommendation so. always is to my guys is when people compete um, on show day, I always say, look, if you think you can eat, let's say, 200 grams volume of food, let's say, you know, say two muffins or say four pieces of toast. I always say eat quarter of that, let it digest, let it like you should always be feeling hungry, like not hungry, yes. just hungry. That your stomach, you should feel like your stomach is shrinking by the minute. You can eat yes. every 20 minutes. I have no problems, but rather than stuffing your face and then uh, waiting for two hours, it's better to keep eating 20 thing. minutes. And don't experiment. On the show day, you see people eating cheeseburgers and fries and pizza. Eating, eating foods they <laughs> never ate before, Never right? ate before. Foods I said, they haven't had for three months. I said, like, would yeah. you take a car that you have never driven before and take it into the deep end? You wouldn't. You know, you don't know how it's going to no. react. You know, so how is your body yeah. any different? 
Okay, well, that's good. So yeah. what's, what's a one must not do? You must not do this on the show day or leading up to the show that, like, don't do this. If you had to pick, one I think that I, I I think that don't do this is an hour before you go on stage. Don't be eating, don't be stuffing your face with any any cookies, muffins, things of that nature, right? What, so what, what, I think what's, that's your, a what's your take mistake. on? I mean, I, I often see people like, um, and, and I find that find that amazing. You know, people like injecting all sorts of shit. You know, injecting test, and then somebody's injecting trend, and somebody's injecting AMP. I don't know if you like have day, like day like day of the show. Day of the show. Like if you came to India, you walk backstage, oh they, you will find more needles than no you would way. find in a vet clinic. No kidding. No kidding. It makes no sense because, like, you know, a shot up muscle is going to look oil. It's not going to have striations. I don't know. You tell I get me. my guys to stop. I get my guys to stop their injects like a week out. You know what I mean? They're just going to get drier and tighter. You don't want to risk doing a, a, a shot and getting inflammation in the muscle, blurring lines. I don't know. <laughs> foolish. That's so, foolish. Okay. So that's that. You know? So one thing I, I want to hear from your mouth is, um, and I just want more, more like uh, you can agree or disagree with it. I always tell people. I said, like, when you're competing backstage, okay, if you're feeling dizzy, if you're feeling like a massive cramp is coming on, especially anywhere around your heart area or your upper body, like, you get a cramp in your calf is one thing, but you start getting a cramp in your, around your chest area or whatever. My um, foolproof advice is, because a lot of times what happens is when uh, I had guys competing at uh, Mr. World's in, uh, in Uzbekistan. So I tell my athletes, I just said, if you can't reach me by default, if you're feeling dizzy, dehydrated, drop everything, grab water, electrolytes, drink it, bit of salt, sit down, don't yes. do anything fancy, don't fear that shit, you know, my condition is going to go down the toilet, I shouldn't be taking salt. Nothing is more important than staying alive. So that's my advice, like call an EM, um, you know, just don't. So what's your take on something like that? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think if you're getting that type of response, it means that your body is very deficient in either fluid and sodium, minerals. So I think, honestly, if they're feeling that way and they have a little bit of fluid and they have some electrolytes, um, I think it's going to be very good for the health. And I, I also think they're only going to get better and look better from it because that's your body telling you, like, you're deficient, you need this. You know what I mean? So I think that was ex when you were explaining that, that was exactly what I was thinking was electrolytes flu. Uh, last yeah, question. Yeah. What do you think um, is Phil going to do? Is Phil ever going to make a comeback or this is it, you reckon, or he shouldn't make a comeback? I, I don't think so. I think Phil has, you know, other business endeavors and other things going on in his life. And, you know, there's something to be said for someone who has accomplished so much and coming up. You know, he comes from an athletic background playing basketball. And I really feel like you have to have that sort of dog in you to be the best and train like the best. And I think as you get older and you have other responsibilities, other business stuff going on, some people lose that along the way. And I'm not saying Phil's lost it, but I just think things are different than they were when he was younger. And I think if he does come back, he'd maybe do like an Arnold Classic or something like that maybe. I don't know if he'd do the Olympia. But I don't think he has anything else to prove, man. Like, yeah, you know, he was one of the best bodybuilders on the planet. Came back last year after all those years off. He looked unbelievable. So I really don't think there's anything left for him to prove, you know, unless he loves it and he wants to do it. Sure. He wants to give it 100%. Obviously, all the fans, we would love to see him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would love so, to see him. Well, yeah, why do you think he cops uh, so much hate? I mean, it's, the people just love to hate him for some reason. You're like, is it because you think like, um, he, he's been aggressive and he's a mongrel and he says it as it is and he's very reactive or yeah. it's just... I, I, I think I, from, from what I've seen, I, I've talked to him because I think he's a great person. And I think not everyone, you know, maybe does the best job at being themselves online. And maybe they react emotionally and yeah. maybe they say things based on their emotions at the time that they shouldn't say. And... Yeah, I just think maybe just from past experiences, things he said or done, um, maybe just trying to like justify things or trying to like, you know what I mean? Sometimes yeah, yeah, when you yeah, say totally. less, less is less, less is more, yeah, right? Less is more. You try and like over talk and, and get your point across and justify why you yeah. should have won or this or that or 
talking about the haters. Don't talk about that stuff. You know, it just causes more people. You're talking about haters. Now more people are going to be like, oh, let's, let's hate well, on Well, that's them. what they want. They want a reaction. That's what they yeah. want. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they want. Don't yeah. give them the reaction. Totally, you know, it's, totally. when, when you have, when you have that type of like, you know, uh, when you're that successful, that just comes with the territory. Territory, yeah. It's, you know, yeah. look at Brandon Curry. Brandon Curry won the Mr. Olympia and everyone's talking about, uh, oh, his legs, oh, this. What are you guys talking about? He's the best bodybuilder on the planet, planet. that year. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, so that comes, that yeah. comes with the territory. Okay, last thing. Yeah. Now, I, look, HD Muscle has done, you know, very well the last couple of years. What I want to know is like, you know, what are your, some of your products? Where can people reach you? Where, where people can reach HD Muscle? What are your expansion yep. plans, you know, taking it overseas? Um, if you are, then which countries and how can people buy the stuff and what are some of your good products? Like, tell me. Yeah, so so basically, if you just go to hdmuscle.com, um, it will take you to the closest website in your territory. So when we launched last year, we launched during COVID, and we started with Australia. We had Canada, USA, Australia, and Europe, and UK. We have ran into so many hiccups. So Australia implemented some new laws and regulations they're so we crazy. had to pull out they're, they're crazy to, Aussies are crazy yeah, yeah, I can tell you yeah. that oh so we have to reformulate which we're going to be doing we're going to be working with Massive Joes there and we're going to be in Australia probably next year 2022 early um, and recently we just had to close down our Europe and UK because they, we are doing great there getting the products through all of a sudden customs stopped the products and because we have North American trademark ingredients like Pico 2 Glycer Size they don't want them in there they want you to have generic sources like just glycerol. So even like our liver product, they don't want Tudka. So now we're at a point where we're like, well, I don't really want to make my products Substandard. not as good and take out Tudka. Yeah. So we, we're in a we're in a little bit of a weird position right now, uh, trying to figure out what we're going to do for 2022. But we have a lot of interest in India and in, uh, UAE, Middle East. So it's like. We're definitely 2022 is going to be a year of expansion. If you need growth. any help in India, so you know, we're you should, super excited. Let, let, let me know. <laughs> oh, I appreciate it's going to be that. A little I, that's all, you know. Yeah. So you know, yeah. yeah, we have some exciting. We have some very exciting things coming in 2022, um, and I think when that when we release that and that happens, I think there'll be a big push in India. So we're uh, we're looking forward to that. Good. And what about if people want to reach out to you for coaching, you know, do you take any clients or you're not taking clients or any of your terms and conditions that like you only work with certain yeah. particular kind of people, like what's the go with that? Yeah. yeah. So for clients right now, um, right now I'm not taking any personal clients, but I have a whole bunch of coaches that work under me for team HD, like Justin Compton, Cody, Amy, who just turned pro. Uh, we have a whole lineup of coaches that you guys can see on team HD training.com. And I oversee everything. It's all my principles. And they're actually taking on clients. Um, you guys can reach, you know, you can reach out to you on Instagram, Dorian underscore Hamilton. I got a YouTube channel. I got, you know, so look me up. I'm doing, uh, I'm actually recording this entire trip on my YouTube channel. Yeah. Like Day in the Life, showing you guys Regan Grimes, dialing in all the athletes and whatnot. And, so check it out. It's yeah, cool. no, no, definitely. Like, we'll, we'll add a link to all to your, in, in once so we upload this awesome. video, we'll add all the links to you know you know, you're very well liked in the industry you know nobody ever has anything uh, bad to say about you know they all think like you know you're a good dude no, I appreciate and that. I, I have i have no different opinion i think you i think you're a top bloke uh, very warm very friendly very you know you've got time for everybody you know, and and right in the middle of you know two days out from the olympia you know you've got five athletes <laughs> on stage so i think uh, you know yeah. you deserve all, all all the love that you get and um it's very Thank easy uh, to get misconstrued because people are just busy and they often they, they can be misconstrued as arrogance. It's not arrogant. You just yes. people just don't have time. And um, and I, I think know. you do very well to actually balance that. Um, yeah, thank so you. we've got nothing but uh, love for you, Dorian. And um, yeah, look, oh, thank you. any any last uh, parting words for your fans or any, any anybody out there, you know, you know, feel free to, to, to share or any, any like life oh. advice and say like don't do this or do this or whatever yeah. it is you know yeah yeah well first off I really appreciate you having me you know on your show it's amazing we've been trying to coordinate this for a while yeah, it's, it's, and it has been. I'm, I'm glad we could get time in I really appreciate it and for any, everyone that supported me and everyone that subscribed to my YouTube channel support HD Bustle and everything we're doing um, I can't thank you enough you know seeing that type of like positive feedback you know the comments and the growth of the companies and everything together is what sort of gives us the motivation to keep 
going. Um, yeah, it's it, it, it really is incredible. You know, when you when you support, you know, so, like when you're supporting us, it, it, that's what gives us the drive to keep going, keep putting out content, keep doing this. Without all you guys and you guys supporting, we we wouldn't be able to do this, and we love it. So we appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. you, thank you for your time. Well, I think we can call it a day, and um, you know, next time when we catch up, we can yep. talk about other things. I mean, we can do one post Olympia, you know, and we can talk about it, and you know, who won, why they didn't win, Absolutely. and you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And we can go over the whole thing, and you know, but uh, thanks very much, Absolutely. Mike. You know, I really appreciated your time. You, I hope all your athletes do well. I wish you nothing but the best, Thank and you. you know, I really, really sincerely wish you know everything goes smoothly and uh, be safe, all your athletes safe, and I'll um, talk to you on the other side. All right. Thanks, mate. Thank you very much. All, All right, right guys. No, we'll see you later. I don't know how to, how to turn this thing off, but I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs>